I'm gonna have to try really damn hard to not have any Uno puns spill out of my mouth for this one. Anyways, if you go on Steam or the PlayStation 4 store, or maybe the Nintendo eShop, you can find a visual novel called Uno, you know, A Girl Who Chants Love at the Bounds of This World, and you'll be immediately blasted by the image of a very sleepy naked woman. Fifty bucks if you won't enter. I mean it. I hope I don't lose my channel over this video, by the way. Anyways, this game was made by Mage's Game and came out in March of 2017 for PlayStation 4 and was later ported to Switch and PC. If you think this game looks interesting, I cannot stress this enough. Do not play this game. Now you might be asking why. Well, two reasons. One, this is a really bad remake. And two, two better versions in English came out two decades earlier. You know, originally came out on December 26, 1996 for the PC-98, and was ported to the Sega Saturn in 1997, and was lastly ported to Windows 9X in 2000, under the Elf Classics label, and was sold in very limited quantities. If you are even halfway interested, play the PC-98 version on your PC, or the Windows version now. Leave right now and go play them. If not, still do it. And if you came to see a guy with too much time on his hands, halfway attempting to explain why this game is so great, you've come to the right place. But first, Elf, or as the Japanese pronounce it, Elf. Elf was officially founded in April 1989, but they started making games in December of 1988. The company was founded by ex Tale members, scenario writer Masato Hiruda, artist Toshihiro Abiru, and programmer and scenario writer Asuchi Kanao. And so they were like, hey, fuck these guys who are about to fuck up the entire Aero game business in a couple years. What if we make our regular old tried and true games that have been innovating for years and add beautiful naked women into them. And so that's what they did. After making two games being published by a different company, Kirara, they became independent. While Elf is known for visual novels, they mainly made RPGs. All sorts of them, actually. You have your traditional RPGs like Angel Hearts, Dragonite 3, Raygun, and Metal Eye 2, Dungeon Crawler Wizardry clones like Dragonite 1 and 2, Tension Ranma, Wordsworth, and technically Isaku. And your strategy RPGs like Foxy 1 and 2, Shangri-La 1 and 2, and Dragonite 4. But they didn't just make RPGs. They also made a racing game, a Mahjong game, because of course, why not? And straight up adventure games, and also a horror game. But their most important title from around the time was probably Dokusei, released in late 1992. Dokusei was basically the grandfather of all modern dating simulations. It was one of the first great evolutionary steps of the dating sim genre. Dokusei had all the stuff you needed, like a variety of women to choose from, comedic elements that gave it such an amazing 90s charm, and great music to boot. So what people decided to do was copy that. Konami made a game called Tokimeki Memorial in 1994, which is a little like Dokusei, but more RPG-heavy elements, and no sex. Also interestingly enough, the main focus of both games' cover art is the red-haired girl which you can encounter in both games. Also, Sakura Wars, which is basically Dokusei, but no sex, and 1920s mecha shit. It's pretty cool, I also recommend it. And so Elf made their own sequels to that game, ported it to consoles, and made it a timeless classic, apparently. Sadly, none of these games actually got English versions at the time because, of course, visual novels were a major niche at the time. And they are still, to this day, in some capacity. Despite that, somehow Dragonite 3 got a localized version called Knights of Zentar for MS-DOS by Megatech Software, and it was ass. Not only did they not localize Dragonite 1 and 2, but they also cut a shit ton of dialogue that even mentioned the two games, which happened to be a lot of the game. And all of that surviving dialogue was not edited or checked by anyone, I think at least because of all the blatant spelling errors everywhere. Oh yeah, cue the legendarily bad voice acting. And we got it first, the Falcon Sword and the Genji Armor. Obviously, Knights of Dentar became a cult classic and will probably overshadow the rest of the entire Dragonite series until the end of time, even if a better, more polished up, localized version of Dragonite 3 comes out. Elf wasn't just Elf, though. 
In 1992, the company made another brand for lower end budget adventure games rather than RPGs and Dane Sims. That brand would be Silkies. Mainly, they published some Nukige titles in the beginning, and then came Kazurasaki K no Ichikosu, or the Kazurasaki family. It was a depression game, or Usuge, but it had a very interesting twist. There were a lot of choices, and those choices could lead to a lot of endings. It's an interesting idea, and Silgi continued with this type of game concept with Nonomura Byun no Hibotito, or the people of Nonomura Hospital in 1994, and whatever the fuck you call this, which is translated to Paradise Lost in 1995. And during these releases, you have your Inukige, some adventure games like Rira, Jack, and probably the most interesting title of the company's releases, 1996 Beyond. The game was written by Mune Mitsu Suga, who you may know as the lead writer for the Utawarumi Mono series. Anyways, enough about the history. One of Elfco's main strengths was its constant focus on high quality releases. I'm mainly talking about the later post-1991 games, because after that they mainly had their eyes on massive big budget releases. The art would be beautiful and stunning, the music would be catching, thrilling, but also calm at some times, the story and dialogue would be long and drawn out, and some games would have multiple endings, which would allow for a lot of replayability. And the amount of time you would have to sink into these titles would make your 8800 or 9800 yen a great investment. And sometimes these games were quite the steal. In 1994, if you wanted to buy an RPG for your PC-98, you could buy Dragonite 4 for 8800 yen, which would take you around 40 to 50 hours to complete, or Brandish 3 by Falcom, which would take you around 20 to 30 hours to complete for 12,800 yen. Not to shit on Brandish 3 or anything, that is also a great game and series in and of, of itself, but if you had the option to buy either one of them, I'm sure you'd buy Dragonite 4 unless you didn't like any sort of porn in your games. And Elf didn't just make games, they also had a lot of merchandise like these Dokusei figures and some soundtrack CDs. They also had a fan club which was advertised in games like Foxy and Dragonite 3, and it had some few benefits and they actually continued running the service well into the 2000s. And of course, anime. Lots and lots of anime were produced, heck some even got English releases. They were bad translations mostly, but hey, at least they had funny dubs. So, you don't have any plans? I'm flat broke, man. So, I'll probably just watch videos in my room. Oh, I see, Kenta. Does that mean you've got some good porn? Maybe. Oh, really? Can I come over tonight and watch some with you? No! You can see it after I'm done with it. Ah! Oh, come on, Kenta. Don't be such a jerk. Let's check it out together tonight. Shit! Don't grab me like that, asshole! You having an intimate moment, boys? Well, anyways, back to Eve Burst Air. It wrapped up development sometime in 1995. Enter Hiruta, one of Elf's founders and the main scenario writer for the company's titles, as well as a player in the production, planning, and supervision, or game design of some titles produced at the company. Hiruta came to Kano around the time Eve wrapped up development, or after it was finished, and asked him if he would like to join Elf make some titles which would give him a much higher budget than anything that Seasware could ever attempt to give him. And, since Elf was the largest name in the Arrowgate business at the time, Kano accepted. He was hired as one of the board members and began work on his next title. Now, the year was 1996. It was truly an interesting time for video games. For Japanese PCs, PC-98 DOS games were on their way out. Windows 95 was gaining a lot of traction, so many companies were jumping ship to that operating system, like Alisoft, who released Kijikoku Rants in 1996 and gained so much success at the time that they were able to keep the game at the original full price well after the game was released. And the 16 color pixel art style was also on their way out. 256 color was obviously taken over, which allowed for a lot more color depth and allowed the art on screen to be leagues better, more accurate to the original drawing than before. 1996 was basically the last year most developers would release games for the PC-98 DOS. Yeah, you had your Dojin devs and some oddball titles like Gita Megami Tensei in 1997 and Love Escalator in 1998, but 1996 was basically the last major year for the system. 
Along with that, Elf was restructuring, and more on that later, but they were able to crank out two games in 1986 under the Elf label. Not out of the ordinary, the past two years would only have two games being released that year. Kagusei was the first one to be released in June. For that game, Elf brought in a lot of new talent. Some only working on Kakusei, but some also worked on Kano's title. Anyways, there were a lot of changes in the industry and in Elf. An era was coming to an end within the year. And so, along with 20 other people, including composers Umimoto, Takami, and Kanane, all coming in from Seasware, Elf would release their final title for the PC-98, and their most famous title of all. You know, a girl who chants love at the edge of the world. And yes, I am using the fan naming, not the official 2017 naming, please fuck off. You know, was released on December 26th, 1996, for 9800 yen. Anyways, I think that's enough poorly written exposition on how the game came to be. Now on to the game itself. For most of this review, I'm not going to be going into any sort of spoilers, or any kind of story unless I have to for obvious reasons. But there will be a spoiler section when I need to rant about the late game's insanity. So seriously, if you haven't played this game, do so. Just letting it out there, this is footage of the original Windows Teal Wiki fan patch, not the emulatable PC-98 translation that came out recently. Anywho, the first two hours of this game is, of course, a prologue. You are introduced to the cast of characters and the basic premise of the game in a linear route. Our protagonist is Takuya Arima, a high school student living in Sakimachi. He has a difficult relationship with his father who has disappeared and is declared dead and doesn't remember his mother at all. He lives with his stepmother, Ayumi, who is still grieving her loss but tries to put that away, all of that said grief, by working herself to death on an exhibition work project. You also meet many other characters like Eriko, a skimply dressed nurse who smokes around 20 packs every day, Misuki, a school teacher who is an assistant to the headmaster and has a long loving relationship with Takia, Mio, your required to Sendere, who is more interested in continuing Takia's father's work, Kidori, a local news reporter who is basically trying, to, trying anything to procure the latest scoop on what is happening and Kana, who is a quiet girl who's mysterious and quite bizarre. Toyotomi, who is this game's Nikaido, but a lot more assholery and criminal. Yuki, your typical student who is friends with Takia. And I forgot why he exists, maybe it was some scrapped gay roots. And finally, Ryu Zonji, who is the headmaster, was friends with Takia's father, and is quite obviously not the friendly type of guy. And that is your entire cast for most of the game, minus a few barely relevant characters like this guard. Anyways, the gameplay is, for this section is menu-based, similar to Eve Burst Error and Desire. Instead of in those games, the choices are in the middle of the screen instead of inside the text bubble. Since the segment is short and linear, it is not possible to find yourself getting lost. Unlike, early, unlike in earlier games, you can just meet the characters, learn some exhibition, and then it's capped off with a thrilling scene with so many stakes and such. This scene is just a perfect show off for what you're going to be experiencing for about the next 40 to 50 hours or so. Naked women, thrills, mystery, amazing music, etc. But wait, fuck all those sections shit, this game has motherfucking time travel. The game takes on a genre shift very early, changing from a typical menu based adventure game to a point and click adventure. This section is the main portion of the game, heck there's even a little demo after the opening that shows off the gameplay with a shed. Oh boy, the shed. Now I must say, this gameplay change is perfect. The pointing and clicking is very fluid and it's very easy to know where to go and what to click on. Well, in my experience it was, but the whole crypticism of it is part of the experience. If the cursor hovers over something that can be clicked on, it will display some text on, in the text bubble, 
with the type of command along with what is being hovered over, depending on what the command is. Along with that, the cursor will change to a different sprite, depending on the command. The talk command, along with some of the other commands, is a very variation of a cute anime face. The look investigate command is a magnifying glass, and the spank command in, is a hand, and the lick command is a tongue. Very nice cursors, very nice. Now if you open one of the menus in the UI, you can find this chart following to the right. This is the flowchart, obviously, and it's the first ever game to include one of these kinds in the game and not to have the player chart out one on paper if that was ever needed. And it's not used to have checkpoints for the player to jump through to skip some events and reach other routes. Well, you can do that, but it's just a really bad and wasteful idea. You have these jewels here on the bottom right of the screen, and this is basically a save slot. You can press on one at any time in the game, and it will drop a save point at that time and place it in the flowchart. You can come back to that time later when you need to. It's basically tied into the plot because you begin with two of them, and you have to obtain the remaining amount of them throughout the section of the game to unlock the epilogue. The save points are somewhat useless if you use a guide, but at points, they can be used to go back to before a route split and save 20 minutes of redoing some of the game's content. Also, some of the jewels can be a little bit tricky to acquire if you don't know what you're doing. For example, one of them requires you to be locked in a shed and spend 10 minutes clicking on everything, hoping to progress. Once that happens, you find it, but you're teleported to a later point in the route, missing some content. However, if you have a jewel save before going into that shed, you'll be fine, but how would you know to do that? Anyways, you have five main routes in Yuno. The progression order is somewhat forced on the player, like a lot of newer VNs like Tsutsuki Hime, Fate, and Zero Escape. I mean, it's technically forced, if you attempt to play the last route first, you will be stuck, but hey, you have the choice to waste your time at least. The order you will play the routes in if you want the fastest and least tedious experience is Eriko Misuki, Ayumi, Mio, Kidori, and finally Kana. They all take you through a different part of what goes on in the course of the game's two days or so, and they all take a few different takes on what different genres and themes. Eriko Misuki's route is very heavy on some horror elements. While it's not exactly creepy, and I know horror is a genre that is a little thrown around a lot when it shouldn't be, but it has some similarities to something you would see in a cult horror slasher film. Ayumi's route is considered a usuge by some, but I consider it to be a nakige in a way. Nakige is a term that means the game uses some depressing elements to be memorable. For example, making the player cry or whatnot. An usuge or depressing game would mean it's trying to completely depress the player, and yeah, this route can do stuff like that. But unlike more down-to-earth traditional usuge titles, this game has its happy endings. While a lot of usuge visual novels will pull some absolutely horrific stuff front to back and cap it off with a grand death finale, it's halfway between those terms and my interpretation of it all. Ayumi's character arc is full of her own issues that bring her to the brink of collapse. No spoilers, play the fucking game. Mio's route is more like an investigation or detective story. Having her go through with her obsession of doing an investigation of an ancient rock formation, Sword Cape. I'd say this route is my favorite out of the bunch. It has two sub-routes which you can either take Yuki or Misuki down into the dungeon. There are some story changes between the two, but it doesn't really matter overall which one you choose. I forgot to do Misuki's version of the subroute, but hey, gotta make Yuki halfway relevant for the plot. Kadori's route is somewhat like a heist thriller. It's not really a route, but more of an essential bad ending that you have to do to neb an important item for another route, which would be Kana's. 
This is my least favorite route of them all because it doesn't really end. Yes, most of them ha do have real endings, like the Miu, Mi, Mio, and Kana routes all have unlockable true endings when you finish the epilogue. And the normal endings lazily end with Tagia being thrown into the Shadow Realm Time Void bullshit, and you just had to load a jewel save or restart from the beginning of the ADMS section. But Kaidori's route just explicitly tells the player to load a save file and escape out of there for reasons. No spoilers, play the damn game. And then you have Kana's route. I'm not exactly sure what type of genre this is, but I'd say it's more of a romance type of deal. But the thing is, you can do all these routes, but you need those jewels. In fact, I'm sure you don't even have to finish the routes. Just grab the jewels and go. But why would you do that? And if you don't grab the jewels, good luck with the backtracking. Anyways, besides finding yourself lost and confused while trying to gather the many jewels, actually not knowing where to go in the world is not that easy. There's no world map, but the route to go to the locations is easy to figure out and just makes sense. It's probably a product of the developers having to pay more attention to the game art for the player to click on. And damn, the art in this game just looks beautiful. I'd say a lot of these are some of the best art ever made on the entire system. Like, oh my god, look at this character art for Mio. Look at the dithering on all of the points. I wonder how long it took for someone to put this into the game. And to top it off, there are some smooth eye-blinking animations everywhere. Elf really did go above and beyond for this game. The only design that I don't really like is Takuya himself. He just looks like the average Arrogay protagonist. White t-shirt, black hair, probably the most cookie cutter design ever made. But you really never see him at all in this section, so it's halfway excusable. Oh yeah, and there are some puzzles spread around the game, because what's a point and click adventure without a few puzzles? I'd say they are pretty good and nothing annoying about them. Now, the voice acting is also very well done. I'm glad that Elf decided to ditch the protagonist not having any voice acting and give all of the characters in the game a lot of great lines. The lines are from the console version, although the adult scenes don't have any voice acting. But I'd say that all of the casting is great. But hey, maybe it's shit I would not know. The dialogue is a bit too horny for my taste at points, but when the game needs to be interesting, it really does. But I do have one major problem with this section, tedium. For example, if you use an item at one point in the route, you have to go back and retrieve that item again. That sounds like a good idea in practice, but if you want to do two endings back to back that need the same item, you have to pray that you have a jewel save at that point where you can find that item. I also found events in text repeating a lot for going back to start another route, which is completely fine. This is really the first game of its kind, and unlike VNs like Suzuki Hime, which allow you to skip some already read texts, this game has gameplay, so skipping stuff would be incredibly stupid. Another thing that I had, and this just may be a me issue that I had, when I fucked up at the part where you have to go into the shed to grab a jewel, I just skipped past that part uh, of the thing and just triggered a different event that occurs at that point, and I spent like three hours later on redoing that part of the game. Which is annoying, but hey, it happens. I'm sure like other people who did it blind probably had more of those issues. So I'm, I'm guessing just nitpicking. And you know that trigger to be locked in the shed was felt like it was random. I also really didn't like the non-consensual adult content that was all around the roots. It's shown in a short amount of detail in each scene that the criminal acts are shown, so that's a good thing, that it doesn't wear out and go on for way too long. And the best part is, all of those scumbags are punished for their acts in the end. Also, Takuya doesn't do any of that stuff throughout the game. Mostly. So that's pretty good that he's a good boy, unlike Toyotomi and that other guy, I forgot his name, he doesn't even have a VNDB page. 
Anyways, the ADMS section is the most revolutionary part about the game. The fun point-and-click gameplay, the forced root order, the flowchart, and the use of time travel had an effect on the industry. But when you eventually track down all of those jewels and unlock a few things, you enter the epilogue. This next section, if you can't obviously already tell, is crammed full of spoilers. If you haven't finished the game in any form or played it at all, my first question is, why are you here? I'd advise you to skip this part of the video and finish the game. Form your own opinion, because you're gonna need it. This is where the opinions on the game split. The epilogue is not really an epilogue. It's more of like a final quarter of the game, where a lot of the world building and exposition is dumped on the player, and the story happenings are wrapped up, and you finally find closure on everything. Mostly. The point-and-click gameplay is completely ditched for this section, instead favoring the menu-based choices that you can find in the prologue. It's even more linear than anything else seen in Seas Where Games and Yuno's prologue. You don't need a guide, even if you're the dumbest player around. Almost the entire section you cycle through some choices, and then you get a scene transition, and then you automatically proceed to the next one. You can't make any real choices, it's all linear, as I said earlier, the opinions are pretty divided. Some love it as a great ending for the game and love the world building it brings to the table. Some hate it due to its genre shift from the point and click interface and the weird content that's somewhat shoehorned in. Hell, one person on YouTube, Minase, did a long play of the original Windows version and didn't do the epilogue because they really fucking hated it so much that they didn't want to spend 20 or so hours recording and editing and all. Me? I'm kind of split on it. I think the ballsy move to change the whole gameplay style and the world building is also great, but as a type of starting point. My problem with the world building of De La Grante is that it should have been expanded on much more. When I finished the game, I felt like I was kind of missing something about the ending story. Personally, I adore high fantasy, like western stuff with all the Tolkien knockoffs, and right now I'm getting into all of the Japanese Record of Lotus War stuff and those knockoffs. Semi off topic, but when I finished Shin Megami Tensei 5 last year, I'd say I felt the same way about the ending. But hey, that game is missing a lot of much needed world building story and lore like you know but to a more extreme length, so I don't know. Back on track, this alien fantasy world that Tagia was thrown into should have been given a little bit more room to breathe and expand. Yeah, it already tells you a lot of stuff about the world, like the whole desert issue, the weird religion stuff, and how the people of De La Grante blood works. I would have liked a whole lot more lore, like wars, the history of De La Grante, and all of that. A strategy RPG type deal would have been interesting for this. Hey, wait a minute! In all seriousness, I would have wanted more world building and more content thrown in while the major time jumps occur. I'm not exactly sure if the game was rushed, but I've heard some speculation that this section was probably going to be a separate game, but decided to end Yuno know, like this and make a sequel to explore the world more than the original. More on that later. Also, the major issue I have is the incest that comes around, and uh, I'll talk about that in a bit. And to avoid the very high potential of an age restriction, I am going to call incest electrical love from now on as a half joke and half out of fear. I do like the cute little scene between Salus and Takia, where he attempts to figure out her name because she can't talk. And then they have a kid named Yuno. Finally, the title makes sense after 40 hours of playtime. Also, I think that the aging of the different elf race in De La Grante is just an excuse to have Takia not being an old geezer in the final parts of the game. I'm guessing that having a game starring some protagonist who is older than 16 to 25 was a little unpopular and still is actually. Though Elf would make a game with such a character in Shuzaku in 1998. Anyways, basically how the aging for Yuno is, 
is that four years of human aging would take one year for Yuno to go through. In the end of the game, four years have passed, so she's around 20 maximum in human age. The ripe age for you know what. Ah, oh, fuck, I said it! So Takio would be around 24 at the end of the game, not 36. Though, you know was still an immature airhead, despite looking like a 16 year old. Somehow, this makes it even weirder than before because she's technically 4. Oh, fuck this, I'm done pondering. Also, one weird thing about De La Grantians is some characters have long elf like ears but other characters don't really. I like to thank Shinto Kritra for pointing this out or else I would have completely forgot about this tiny little detail. All of the men in De La Grante who do not have elf ears, but all of the women who are native to De La Grante have long ears. All of them are genetically engineered anyways. Hi, editor me here. I forgot to mention what genetically engineered means. Basically, in the context of this game, basically all the De La Grantians are, like, aged differently. As, like, you know, how you know is, like, 20 in physical age, but she's technically 4. So, basically, all of the De La Grantians are like that. So, that is what genetically engineered means. Uh... Kun Kun is pretty cute, I'd buy a plushie of that character. Sadly, Salus was mo one of my favorite characters in the game, and she dies like two hours into the epilogue. What a world we live in. Another weird thing is the halfway shun toward end characters. For example, here's Sala, or maybe she's Sara as in Sarah, oh who knows. Japanese L and R translations are fucked from the get go. She's the character for the mandatory sadism and masochism scene, and then she talks with Takuya about some stuff, and then she's tied up again for more nefarious purposes by night by old man Takuya. And she's just kind of never heard from ever again. I thought she would show up at the end of the story for some sort of cool comic relief stuff. Now that I think about it, that wouldn't make sense, but come on. Oh, she doesn't even have her own VNDB page. Hell, some characters don't even have them as well, like Ilya, who I originally thought was named Dila before proofreading the script. Either that issue, or was because I haven't played Yuno in a while, or I'm just that stupid. And Kun Kun, and technically Amanda. Odd. Ilya has some relevance to the plot, and Kun Kun is very relevant to Amanda's in Takuya's prison escape later on. I think Sala is just there to have some extra adult CG wallpapers in. Or maybe I'm probably wrong, I and I'm missing some major part about the lore or themes of De La Grante. If I am, please tell me, I like being corrected. The prison stuff is also interesting. The escape, though, uh, kind of rough how you get to see Takuya and Amanda just fucking eat Kun Kun. The rebellion stuff with Amanda didn't really feel very fleshed out. It should have been some strategy slash tactical RPG stuff in there, not gonna lie. And the final scenes with Yuno and Takuya reuniting, having her sacrifice herself for Dean Legrante, so so powerful. When they talk it all out and such. Oh no. Oh no! Talk here! Don't do it! Don't do it! Think back to police knots and uh, how Jonathan didn't fucking do it. Oh wait, he did. Wait, he did do it. Oh shit. Man, I'm fucking done with this game. I would say that most of the adult scenes during the epilogue are quite pointless. The Salus and Takuya scene makes sense because it's more plot changing event in the story that needs to be shown off to the masses. Everything else, uh, no. I mean, come on, Takuya is all like, this is wrong, and then two minutes later he does the good old electrical love act with you know. And then a man that fucking dies. <laughs> Lol.
and boom, semi-happy ending until they decide to pull some um, Adam and Eve bullshit with Taka and Yuno, and the game's over. Yay. Great game, weird as fuck climax. Literally. I should stop penetrating the script with cheap Inueno. But the game isn't over yet. If you so desire, you can replay Ayumi's, Mio's, or Kana's roots to see their true endings, showing what happens to their lives instead of the protagonist being thrown into the Great Time Abyss. They're cute, they have some nice epilogue to their stories, and it's cute to see how it, that would end. The other two roots don't have such a thing for obvious reasons. And then they have the SP disc content. Like a Picross minigame, something called Go Go Salus. Skip through that one to see the ending for something later. And then you have a fan art gallery, where you can see some MS Paint quality fan art drawn by some fans, with stuff from other elf games like Dokusei and of course Yuno. Like this cute image with Kun Kun saying, Was I tasty? Like, oh my fucking god, I'm, this game never stops. Alrighty, I think that's it for all the spoilers and the red team. One of the main reasons some people play this game, besides the sexual content and how revolutionary it is, is the spectacular music done by the three composers, Kazuhiro Kakane, Ryu Umimoto, and Ryu Takami. The soundtrack is truly a masterpiece. Clocking in at around 5 hours along, the soundtrack pushes the OPNA or YM2 to 2608 chip to its absolute limits. It's quite possibly the longest soundtrack for the system, and each track is memorable. I can't describe how great it is in words. From the calming track like Love 1 and 2, Memories and Reminiscence, to the atmospheric tracks like Rare Metal, Remains and Illusion, to the upbeat tracks like Ayumi, Fengi Tang, and Wan Paku. To the sinister sounding tracks like Parting and Those Who Leave. To the absolute bops that are Fate, Crisis, and Travel. And, there are, and there's also my personal favorite track, Ending. There's also some remixes of Dokusei and Kakusei music like Yui Narusawa in Lower Grade Girl. You also have your Dubsy remixes. They're both called Arbiswe, or whatever you call it. But the OPN version is the one that is actually Arbiswe, while the OPNA version is actually a remix of Claire de Lune. Oh yeah, the different versions of the soundtrack. Unlike any other elf game, Yuno took advantage of the YM2608. Every other game made by Elf, even later on into the mid-90s, used the YM2203. This is quite a weird decision, but they probably just wanted to target more stock hardware to ensure better, better sales. As for you know, the OPN versions are just terrible. Well, they're good, but not as good. The three composers definitely made the tracks for the OPNA chip, and then downgraded them so that people who had more stock hardware could also listen to the music without much trouble. However, it seems they got lazy with this downgrading at some points. If you use a PC98 music player software like FMDSP, you can see the channels play the notes on whatever song you please, as long as it can run on hardware. In some tracks you can hear in the epilogue, you can see here that the notes are attempting to play on channels 3 to 5. However, since the OPN chip doesn't have those channels, the notes aren't played. This is either a product of laziness or being rushed out the door. I don't know. There are two other versions of the soundtrack, one in 1997 for the Sega Saturn port and the 2017 remake version. I don't hate the Saturn version of the soundtrack. In fact, it does a great job of adapting the soundtrack to the Sega Saturn's different sound hardware. But I think that the PC-98 version is still better. And as for the 2017 remake version, that one's just bad. Before we talk about all the cool stuff about the English translation community that's around these days, 
First, I needed to talk about the cool world of Korean fan translations for elf titles. Back in the mid to late 90s, fan translation of elf titles were actually quite popular in South Korea. For example, Dokusei was so popular that everyone who had a computer in the country had the game or at least had heard about it. It even prompted Elf to release some games in the country's market officially, like Dragonite 4. And they even tried to make their own translations, or they just paid some of the fan translation teams to work on those official versions. The fan translations ran on MS-DOS, not PC-98 DOS. It was leagues more accessible, and I don't believe that NEC attempted to claim ground in the Korean market. But the IBM compatibles did, and the DOS market continued to flourish for quite a while, even after Windows 95 first came out, because Korea was somewhat behind the curve. Anyways, ELF titles starting around 1993 include some compression techniques, like compiling all the images and scripts into DAT, ARC, or whatever type of one file technique Yuno and Isaku uses. All of this compression could be gotten rid of with some tools made by Juice Kim, one of the main people who worked on Korean elf translations. Yuno's compression was, of course, cracked sometime in 1997, but no one bothered attempting to translate the game, sadly. Jump to 2011, Tio Wiki, a visual novel fan translation group that had also done work on the original Chaos Head, Sayano Yuta, and also worked on the official translation of Karo no Shoujo with Manga Gamer. They also got the 32-bit Windows version of Yuno into English along with going above and beyond by adding the limited voice acting from the Sega Saturn version. I'd say this is the best version of them all, except for the bugs. It doesn't fix many of the compatibility issues that old Windows games have to deal with so it can run correctly on modern Windows, so it can be tricky to get run running correctly. In around 2020, work began by quite a few people to create tools for the PC-98 versions of Elf games and later on Fairy Tale, and have them finally translated. One of the first projects that began was a script for port for Yuno. Baba Jinmil, along with multiple other people from the scene, created a script patch with some updates like typo fixes. However, it doesn't include the voice acting from the Saturn version, because it would have a lot of testing and research to be done, which is just not worth it. I'm sure that they would rather work on other projects like Sincho Kreta, who did the proofreading for you know, and right now is working on Dragonite 4 for PC-98 and potentially other systems as well. Dragonite 4 is one game that I am massively hyped to play, if I haven't made it completely obvious yet, because I have mentioned it like seven times already. Now it's time to get a little theoretical. In the final scenes of Go Go Sailus, you can get this stupid little scene where you can see Sailus in a school uniform with some funny dialogue and dumb fourth wall breaking. It's just some standard fan service stuff. Along with advertising Mr. H's next game, which is referencing to Hiruta. But before all of that is shown off, you have this funny little dialogue, but also you have Salus and Takio talking about Yuno's adventure with Kun Kun when she was a kid, and how they'll be telling that story at one point. This is hinting at a sequel of some sort, if that isn't already obvious. But as time went on to tell, this game, whatever it would become, never came out. Yuno stayed as a standalone game, without any other games made by Elf to expand on the gameplay, story, and lore. Very sad, but it happens. However, something close to it came out. 8-Bit Yuno's Adventure was a game that came in pre-orders of the 2017 remake of Yuno. Oh yeah, the remake. Oh god no, the remake. Yep, this game was remade recently. Is it good? Fuck no. Okay, so on March 16th, 2017, a remake of Yuno came out for the PlayStation 4, along with the Vita. In March of 2019, it was ported to Nintendo Switch, 
in Windows in October. English localizations were released on October 1st, 2019 by Spike Chunsoft for the North American releases and Numskull Games for the European releases. All systems except the Vita were localized because that console was already dead in the ground at the time. Also, Korean version for the PS4 version in 2018. So yeah, the 2017 remake of Yuno is the most accessible version of the game. But like I said earlier, it's bad and you shouldn't play it unless you have no choice otherwise. Like if you only have a PS4 or a Nintendo Switch, then yeah, it's a fine version of the game. But if you have a computer or a Steam Deck, you probably should just grab Nico Project 21 and a hard drive copy of the PS98 translation. Now you could be asking, what's the big deal with this version? Well for one, let's look back at Eve Burst Error R and A. Came out around the same time as Yuno Remake, and was released for mostly the same systems. Different developer though. All of the art in Eve R is basically identical to the PS98 or Sega Saturn versions, just adding a new coat of paint to everything. It looks good and shows that the original art can still hold up well. So how does the Yuna remake handle all of the artwork? Well, for one, they redesigned fucking everything. Takia looks even more like your typical Eroge protagonist. Let's see what VNDB says about his personality. Huh. Ayumi is dressed up in darker clothing and her hair isn't in a ponytail instead being shorter. Kadori is just fucked up. Her eye color is changed from blue to green, like her hair, and her dress is less revealing, which makes less sense when you wonder how her root goes. Actually, there is way too much green in her design. Kana's is meh. Misuki and Mio's are also just okay. Not good at all. Eriko is more scantily dressed and is more revealing, which I don't like. Marina the Guard looks a lot less pissed in the remake, along with Toyotomi, which doesn't make sense because in the game he is so hot-headed and such. His tie has a lot less detail, along with his suit, which looks a lot more flat in the remake. Yuki is just okay. I think that the hair should have been kept black and kept the backwards cap because it's part of the 90s style. The only one that I think is just fine is Ryuzonji. Ryuzonji looks a bit more evil in the remake instead of looking like some sort of businessman, where he probably just twirls his mustache every day, like the evil man that he is. Overall, the character designs were made to look like your typical any day 2010s anime. It's cheap, generic, and downright insulting to the source material. Not only was the character design changed around, but they also had the music rearranged. It's fine, but at least they had the PC-98 score and option in the menu, so at least that's good. Also, it got released in the West so recently, game journalists got to review it. One of which thought that the game was part Danian Sim, which... What? It's like calling Dasuki Hime a Danian Sim. Going back to E Burster R, LD had decided to have two versions, one for consoles and PC, which had no adult content, and A, which was exclusive to PC but had all the PC-98 fun times. What does the Uno remake do? Well, all the versions are the same and you have no choice to have the racy content or not. Yay. Nay. While in the Vita version, you do have DLC that allows you to play an emulated version of the PC-98 game, only in Japan, that is cut down to not include the adult content. As for the actual game, for one, the prologue and the epilogue ditch the menu-based stuff, instead you click on things like the rest of the game. It's a fine change, however, it makes the genre shift look a lot less jarring and extreme feeling. Overall, it's just an inferior version to play. Some people may like it, and they're probably wrong, but oh well. And some people like me just don't. So what if you want to play this game for yourself? Well, you have three main versions. The 1996 PC-98 version, the 1997 Saturn version, and the 2017 remake. The remake is the most accessible version, but did I not stress enough why you shouldn't play it? Yeah, whatever, it's cheap, but you know what's also cheaper? Fan translations. The PC-98 version and the 32-bit Windows version, called Elf Classics, 
are basically identical besides a few additions that the fan translation includes in the Windows version. If you want to play any of these two versions, I'd say to try to play the Windows version. It's a little bit tricky to have running on modern Windows because it is a nearly 25 year old engine. If you screw around with compatibility settings enough, you can manage to have it run, but there's also some minor bugs at points. If you can't figure out how to make that version work, the PC98 version has a lot better compatibility because it runs on emulators, made for modern computers, but sadly it doesn't include some of the improvements from the Windows version like the voice acting. If you want to get any of these versions physically, the Sega Saturn version is quite cheap these days going for around $30 to $50. The PC-98 version goes for around like hundreds of dollars, like a lot of famous PC-98 titles. Even if they sold better than their console counterparts, the console versions will be much cheaper and easier to find no matter what. Quite odd. As for the Elf Classics Windows version, good luck finding it. It was released in very limited quantities, but if you're lucky and you do manage to get it, you also get two other games with it, Shangri-La 1 and 2, along with a bunch of other cool elf-related goodies, like soundtracks and a keyring, if your copy still has such a thing. Like I said earlier, Elf loved their anime adaptations, and Yuno was no exception. Pink Pineapple is an anime production company that focused on hentai original video animations, or OVAs. During the 1990s, they often worked with ELF to produce the Dokusei and Dragonite OVAs, and in 1998 and 1999, they released four episodes, or volumes as they called, of an adaptation of Yuno. The first episode was released on October 23, 1998 on VHS and surprisingly Laserdisc. The final episode was released on September 24, 1999. Before I get into this anime, I am going to have to dive into a few spoilers yet again, so if you don't want to hear any of that, head to this timestamp display. Anyways, I must say that this OVA is absolute dog shit. Imagine trying to make an anime adaptation of a game. I've heard absolute horror stories about that, looking at you trails in the sky second chapter. But imagine trying to adapt a massive 50 hour story driven visual novel with branching paths and time travel in just two hours of anime. Yeah, how exactly do you do that? Well the funny thing is that Pink Pineapple decided to just not do any of that and just went to town on the changes. Some of the major changes are that they cut most of the male characters outside of Takuya and Toyotomi. Yuki is kind of just doesn't exist in any form or capacity in this one. Now Ryu Zonji is the bad guy shown off immediately in the prologue scene with him and Naomi. So who fills that gap? Why none other than Misuki. Yeah, they just decide to cram both characters' personalities into one. This definitely can't be a major problem going forward. She's just mashed in with the main villain. And they decided to put Ailea's part of the story into Misuki's, complete with her death. As for Toyotomi, he just changed into the shoehorn villain at the end of the OVA, where Takuya and him fight it out. Fight it out. Unlike the game where he just bites the dust after Yayumi's root, like the criminal cunt he is. Oh yeah, everyone just stopped being relevant during the epilogue in the game, not in the OVA. Everyone is here. Why? I don't know. Neo is just thrown in with some scenes with Salus and you know. Another fucking issue, why on earth are there so many lesbians in this anime? Like come on, they just throw these lesbian scenes in like it's candy. It doesn't really need to exist, but hey, at least they are kind of being more inclusive, I guess. Then they decide to have more some straight stuff in the third episode. And I'm not even going to begin to describe these scenes because they are just so fucking disgusting and useless. Anyways, done with spoilers now. In 2019, a new anime was released to accompany the 2017 remake. Interestingly, it was announced in 2016, but took over three years to come out. They said it would they said that the anime would outdo the game in dirty jokes, make Miu more Tsundere, and make Kana more mysterious. 
Instead of four 30-minute episodes like in the 1996 OVA, this anime has 27, 23-minute episodes, which is around the standard length for any anime out there. The total length for all of the episodes is 10 and a half hours. So yeah, the original source material has a lot more room to breathe here. Obviously, since the show is based on the 2017 remake, and it was broadcast on Japanese television, there's no hentai. And yeah, they kept the not-so-good redesigns. The episode's titles are kind of bland and not really that creative. For example, the first episode's title is You Know? So creative. I decided to sit down and watch the show, and I must say, it is one hell of a sleeping aid. As far as I watched, I felt like half of the scenes are just full of very cheap sex jokes. Dreams are manifestations of repressed desires. If that's true, what does a dream of my dead parents mean? Just look at that blue sky and those white panties! So I guess they, they were right about all of that. Takuya is just way too perverted in this anime. And when I say that they are just thrown out there like it's no one's business, I mean it. The anime is all like, haha, aren't sex jokes just mad funny? Well, yeah, they kind of are, but not when they're overdone. Well, yeah. The original game had a ton of dumb adult jokes, but at least it sometimes took breaks from that, and had a full 30 minute sequence where two people try to figure out someone's name, along with some looping 3 joke at one point. Oh yes, and we finally get to hear what all the characters sound like in English. And the weight, it's gotta be an adult, I mean, a very artistic video of scantily clad women posing. I owe you one, Yuki. Uh, it's fine. I only watched the first episode because I don't really watch anime. And I literally have no time to binge this when I know it's going to be a total waste of my time. For my entire life, I've been told to just read the book first before watching the movie because the book is almost always going to be better, and this kind is just basically the same thing. Also, probably the worst part of this anime is that it falls in the line where weebs on YouTube will just re-upload all the sexy scenes with a cheap sexual title, and then get thousands or millions of views from sex-deprived teenagers. Even worse, people getting the most obvious shit wrong. I know that I understand absolutely jack shit, about Takio's family tree in the game, but I don't remember anything about Mio being somewhere in there. Anyways, just avoid the animes, play the source material. What happened to this staff of Yuno can go in quite a few different directions, but I've dumbed it all down to three categories. You have what happened to Hiruta and Elf as a company, everyone who came in from Seasware, and everyone else. I know it's a little stupid going over literally everyone who put their name attached to the game, but you know- Ah, oh, fuck, I said it again! What's also stupid is only talking about the most famous people, which even I've fallen victim to in my videos. Saying Kano was the creator of Yuno is like seeing Trails was made by Kondo, even though like 60 other people worked at Falcom. Anyways, first elf side of the story. Around the time Yuno came out, Elf was releasing a lot of ports to consoles. Yeah, porn games on consoles. One of those systems was the Sega Saturn, which got quite a few ports. First up for that system was a port of Nonomura in April 1996. It was quite successful, having over 30,000 copies. It became the 19th best-selling Sega Saturn game, and these days it sailed as a genre-defining classic. More Sega Saturn ports followed, like Dokusei 1, titled Dokusei If, in August, Kakusei in April 1997, Dokusei in September 1997, and the last one was Yuno in December 1997. All these releases were quite successful, Yuno sold around 140,000 copies. Other systems got ports like the PCFX, the PlayStation, and very late Super Famicom releases going into 1997. They stopped doing console ports after 1997, and since literally everyone was jumping ship to Windows, Elf began re-releasing a ton of their backlog on Windows starting in 1996 with No Nomura. They didn't just port the games, instead they took many different approaches to it. 
you have your basic 16 color ports, like the original Windows version of Isaku, the Elf Classics release, which included Shangri-La, 1 and 2, and Yuno. There were 256 colored versions that had graphics more true to the original art, like Isaku Renewal, Nonomura, Karazurasaki, Dokusei 2, and Kakusei, and many more because there are a bit too many to list. And there were real remakes that changed some parts of the game in design or stories, like Dokusei 1999, Wordsworth 1999, Alley 2000, and Dragonite 4 2007, which didn't have story changes, but instead made the game have 3D graphics and some really good updated 2D graphics that are identical to the original art but have some amazing lighting touch-ups going on. So good looking. Oddly, some other games didn't get ports like the Foxy Duology, the first three Dragonite games, and the two Metal Eye games. Anyways, 1997 was a year with nothing new. In 1998, Elf released Shuzaku, which was a sequel to Isaku, but instead you play as the bad guy, unlike the original game. The Saku series got another sequel in 2001 called Kisaku, and a fan disc the same year. All those games were written by Hiruda, and after Kisaku was released, he left Elf, but still helped out as an outsourcer. The last game he worked on was Kazurasaki K no Ichikosu 2 in 2003, which actually looks like a decent game besides the fact that it's near impossible to find, besides on DMM, and also it has this really shitty DRM that could fuck up your computer. Actually, from my eye, a lot of these earlier Windows releases that are original titles do look interesting and are probably a fun time. From the five or so people that gave ratings on BNDB, it looks like an okay time. This one that translates to lime-colored exotic war story is probably the one I'm most interested in because I do like war-related stories, unless they aren't glorified. In 2004, Elf released Kakusei 2, which gained some controversy at the time because of it having dateable women who aren't virgins. Apparently some people even broke their games in protest, which is quite the waste of money if you ask me because the game actually looks quite decent. In the company's last days, they began experimenting with stuff like Nito Rere, or NTR, which, if you don't know what that is, it's basically the Japanese word for cheating. Heck, this game called My Girlfriend is a Blue Collar Worker, what she did, what was done to me, a plan to capture the voluptuous wife, my wife was stolen by the bastard, recently got an English translation this year. So yeah, quite a lot of infidelity in these later games. Guess who got run into the ground? After making a weird trilogy from 2013 to 2015 with this clown guy as the protagonist, Elf announced in October of 2015 that they were going to be shutting down. The Silkies also disbanded on August 31st, 2014. In their final games credits, released on October 15th, 2015, they had a list of all of their published titles with a message, thank you for the last 27 years. Their IPs were sold off to several different companies, like DMM, who made a gacha game called Dragonite 5, which didn't last long. But that wasn't all for the company. Some of the staff actually formed their own company, Silkies Plus, around the time that Silkies was disbanded. Three people who worked at Elf and you know, still work at er Silkies Plus today and some Silky's Plus games actually got English localizations. But now you might be asking, where did Kana go after Yuno? Well, when he was working at Elf during Yuno's development, he felt isolated. The returning staff was used to working with Hiruda and had a difficult time adjusting to how Kano did his things his way. Or maybe it was just because he was harder to work with. And he suddenly became a board member when he joined the company, so that was quite the thing. So Kano decided to leave Elf. In December 1997, he founded his own company, Abel. And here's where things get a little interesting. Umimoto had some sort of breakdown and disappeared during Yuno's development. Kano was kind of ticked off at him, so when Exodus Guilty, Kano's first game at Abel, was in development in 1998, Umimoto didn't work on the music. Heck, Umimoto and Kano never worked together after Yuno. Kano did keep two of his C's were guys for Exit Skilty, Kanane, who worked on the game's sound effects, and now Taijima, who did storyboard work. Kanane kind of stopped composing after Exit Skilty, 
and he is never credited for a game after this. Exodus is Guilty is an interesting looking game. The concept is very similar to both Yuno and Eve. You have three characters in three different time periods. I want to play this game in the future, but the weirdest part is that if you want to play the game in English, the only option you have is to play it on a DVD player. Not fucking around. They release games on DVD players, and Nexus Guilty somehow got an English release on it. The translation is probably shit since it's mid-2000s localization, but I'll come to it eventually. Abel released other games like the Detective Gentleman series, which would be Tao Jijima's last work at Abel. He worked at other companies, and I think he disappeared, but oddly, he was credited for work on the newest Eve game, which is a little odd. I'm not exactly sure if Abel is still active or has disbanded. Their website is still up, but their last game was released in 2017, and their Twitter account is dead. Let's get back to Umimoto. He did some freelance compositions through the late 90s and 2000s. He did the music for this game called Eclipse with Takemi, and I think it's really well done. The game itself, eh, it looks like shit. Takemi also did other work for Umimoto later on, but he's still active today, doing music for a doujin group. Umimoto also got a bit of international fame with the company Cave for his work on some bold hell shooter games. Sadly, on August 16th, 2011, at the young age of 37, he passed away of chronic bronchitis. A few months later, on December 19th, 2011, at the young age of 42, Hiroyuki Kano passed away due to cerebral infraction and brain hemorrhage. Nine other people worked on Yuno. Three of them only worked on Kakusei in Yuno or just Yuno. Yatsuchika Nagasoka only worked on Yuno, but also did some work on a bunch of anime like Akira. Takeo Kimura was an artist for Yuno, and while working at Elf for Kakusei in Yuno, he worked at Leaf for Shizuku and periodically did work there until 2011. Right now, he says he's in the hospitals for some sort of rehab. He does have a Pixiv account, which is still active. There were three people who were all returning members from earlier elf titles. They all seem to have left the company after you know, and they haven't been doing anything since then. And finally, Minamitsu Suga got a special thanks credit in the game. Like I said earlier, he's still active today working at Aqua Plus, doing scenario writing for the Uda series. While the company has been disbanded, and the writer and the most famous composer passed on, Yuno's legacy has lived on. Many anime, manga, and visual novel creators have cited Yuno or Kano for being a direct inspiration. I've already talked about the writer for Zero Escape who was inspired by Eve Burster, but even more people were inspired by Yuno. For example, the writer for the Danganronpa series has said how he played the Sega Saturn version and wanted to create similar experiences. Hikaru Sakurai, who wrote for Type Moon and Layersoft, cites Yuno as an inspiration. Jun Maeda, the writer for Planet, said it was one of the last games that truly excited him. And more popular visual novels like Fate Stay Night and Steins Gate owe a lot of their existence to Yuno. And since those games are so damn popular, people got inspired by that and the cycle continues. The 80 Mez gameplay was revolutionary and made people want to have such large scale storylines and musical scores with the same amount of quality and ambitiousness as you know. And the concept of a built in flowchart has become a staple of a lot of visual novels and games with multiple routes and endings. So, yeah, that's it. Go play you know, you will have a fun time. As, also, as a final note, Desire and Zenin English translations are finally getting developed on the PC-98 version. If this isn't bad timing, I don't know what is. I kind of just want to cry. At least I get to remake that half-assed review I gave Desire eventually. Anyways, the next video is coming out in like December, I don't know. Anyways, I think that's it for this year of uh, video making. Uh, I also like to thank all of you who have given me so much support on the last video. Uh, since that video came out, I've gotten like uh, 25 new subscribers, which is an amazing thing. Anyways, uh, fucking out. Hey, Katomi, I just bought a brand huh? new car.
Shall we go for a drive? Munimitsu, are you really sure you want me to go with you? Let me go with you, Katomi. I'll make sure that he don't try nothing. Come on now. You know that I'm a gentleman, right? Shit, he's such a show-off. Yo, why is Akimi such a bitch to Miss Kumi? Look at their big, bouncy tits and ass. This is great. Where's your camcorder? It's getting fixed. Jeez. Damn. Hear that? What the hell are you guys staring at? Hey, we're just, like, hanging out over here. Well, I was just looking at your ass. What? You have a really nice ass. I want to grab it. It looks really tight in tone, like a supermodel's. Is is that meant to be a compliment? Of course. Why wouldn't it be? This is a public place, you know. Next time, I'll try to be more discreet, I guess. <sighs> Whoa, man, that was pretty gutsy. Honesty is always the best policy.